The way my long COVID specifically functions is I have something called small fiber neuropathy. The easiest way to visualize it is, imagine a sink. Most people, when they're walking around doing things, their sink has a full level of reserved blood in it. And what this reserved blood lets you do is when you're walking or when you're strenuous, your heart, if it starts to beat too hard or if it starts to get tired, it can call upon this blood to help boost it up. And the blood serves as a backup way so that your heart rate isn't going too fast or you're not straining yourself too hard. I don't have that reserve blood, so my sink is empty. And so because of that, my heart is constantly working, 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 and that causes stress and exhaustion and fatigue in all other parts of my body. So when most people would be able to do something like stand to wash their dishes, and they would have that blood helping booster them, I don't, it's just my heart working. And so because of that, I get really tired really fast. I'm unable to do a lot of things. And then I get things like brain fog because my, all of my energy is just going into my heart, trying to pump. Long COVID is the condition that probably about five to 10% of the people experience after having COVID. It manifests itself in a wide variety of symptoms and issues that range from fatigue and malaise and post-exertional problems when people conduct an activity that they had no problem with and cannot recover, to issues of brain fog, to more than 200 symptoms, which makes it really difficult and really frustrating for the folks that experience it to get good care for. I actually started feeling symptoms on like the day after my 21st birthday in January of 2022. Lab work, I have one for the emergency room, urgent care, um, the recover study in the long COVID. I have allergy, immunology. I'm disease. immunocompromised ever since I was born. Getting COVID weakened my immune system to where I was having respiratory problems, chronic migraines, fatigue, stairs were just impossible. It would raise my heart rate to like 160 beats per minute. And I had severe brain fog, memory loss, and I actually ended up having to medically withdraw at the end of the semester. It really just opened up the door for me to get a whole bunch of other medical troubles. There's certainly a lot more evidence that there is a longer, like months and perhaps even a few years where the viral molecules can be detected in the body. So if you imagine that, you know, our immune system normally is alerted by anything foreign that comes in, into the organism, then you can imagine a protracted immune reaction that is now going, oh my God, you know, there's a raging viral infection here. Now I need to go into the overdrive and I need to, to eliminate it. And as a consequence, the immune system will go around and do damage to the organs and tissues that we have in the body. And so that is the second theory that there is this persistence of the virus that is sitting around, triggering a disproportionate uh, reaction of our immune system. There is also a subset of people prone to autoimmune reactions where the normal process of censoring the immune system whereby it will not attack our own body are weaker. And as a consequence, they would have autoimmunity that would be either generalized against many organs and tissues or perhaps organ specific. But the antigens against which this is targeted are a little more elusive as we still haven't figured out what these parts are. It doesn't seem to be infecting the cells that line up the blood vessels directly, but it seems to be changing them in the long term so that they become more prone to triggering blood clotting. Really, it's akin to small microinfarctions in a whole bunch of different organs that is happening a little more, you know, in your brain and you're having a little more brain fog or in your intestines and you're having more GI problems that could give 
rise to a whole variety of different symptoms that you know then are very frustrating both for the patient of course but also for the physician who's supposed to diagnose it I was 25 when I got long COVID. They weren't seeing it a lot in younger people at that time. I was extremely, extremely active and fit. And so a lot of what I struggled with was communicating to doctors that even though my body still showed some physical conditioning from when I was a runner, that I could feel changes that were wrong and scary. It wasn't until two years in that I found somebody who was seeing an influx of patients for pulmonary issues. And the correlation was just too strong to just ignore. He was the first person to ever sit down and say, this isn't in your head. And that was hugely empowering for me. You would make tea for me. Doctors would look at me and they're like, well, you, you seem fine. Like you seem to be smiling and you're cheery. You're talking back, you know, you're aware of everything. And that was a huge struggle for me. How was your coffee? I am so thankful that I had my family to support me and they believed me because they would encourage me to go seek help somewhere else. While we're doing all of this research, people are miserable. Many people were told, oh, this is, you, you cannot have all of these symptoms. Well, of course you can. I mean, because people are not eager to misrepresent their health condition, to not be able to work. But there, there's a number of very promising studies telling us that, that you know, defining all of this is actually possible. There's always a substantial lag from understanding what a new entity is and being able to treat it. Right now, there's no, no treatments, no way to really cure, specifically the, the long COVID that I have and how it's manifesting. There's times where I really feel the helplessness and loss of what I've gone through. Like, I can't run anymore. I can't go out to hang out with friends anymore. I'm lucky that I can still work. And there are people who have lost their jobs, their homes, their families. There's people who've gone through divorces. I think people are desperate for anything at all that can help them. And as science catches up, which it will do, COVID is still a thing, long COVID is very dangerous, and that there are people who are living with it that still deserve compassion and attention and help. You're not alone. It is a struggle and it is a battle that you have to fight to stand your ground. Finding a good support system, whether that's your family, friends, resource group, online, whoever it is, find a support system. Beyond the individual stories, beyond the, the, the tragedies of losing one's health, it is really an, uh, a national economic issue and a national security issue. These people not only are not imagining that this is happening, they need help. And it is, you know, really in the interest of all of us to provide it. Hi, I'm Tom McNamara, host of Arizona Illustrated. Thank you for watching this story from our show. And for more local content from Arizona Illustrated, just click right here.